to you by Chemistry. Hi everyone and welcome to Brought to You by Chemistry. What's brought to you by Chemistry, I hear you ask? Complicated reactions? Complicated exams? Even more complicated romances? Yes, but in this case it's also a podcast series from the Royal Society of Chemistry, so you see the branding there. My name is Dr. Alex Lathbridge and we're fully charged because in this series we are taking a look at batteries, bringing together experts from inside and outside the world of chemistry to help us understand the ins and outs, the positive and negative, the ups and downs of all things batteries. Okay, so of course, the very first question I'm going to ask um, both of you, um, you can decide who goes first, very difficult. Could I get you to please introduce yourselves? Uh, so Andrew Gorsden, I, I currently uh, represent the National Fire Chiefs Council and the Waste and Recycling Fires Group, and, and we do a lot around um, the waste industry and supporting the, the waste industry and the hazards and risks in, involved in those processes. And I'm Paul Shearing. I'm a professor in chemical engineering at University College London. I also hold the Royal Academy of Engineering chair in emerging battery technologies. And we do a lot of research into the science of battery safety, uh, including uh, with a large uh, Faraday institution research program uh, called SafeBat. Wonderful. Okay, now uh, throughout this podcast, throughout all these episodes, I'm learning a lot more about batteries. And um, I think to start with, let's get away from the chemistry to begin with. Um, so, Andrew, just in, in terms of batteries, what can, what can go wrong with batteries? We find a, a number of specific issues, and, and one of those are uh, people buying replacement chargers that haven't got the right battery management system in and, th and therefore it creates a problem with the battery and that's that's due to really wrong equipment the the other issue that we really come across is how we where what is the end life of a battery how do we manage that process to end of life you know when we buy something we've got to look at the whole life cycle and at the moment a battery is a you know, they're, they're these small items. Nobody's really clear on where to uh, dispose of them. There, there is a battery recycling and collecting scheme. There's a, a battery compliance scheme. Those that put batteries onto the market have to put in place uh, processes to collect the batteries to ensure they go for safe disposal. But, you know, that, that's just one thing in our life. And, and people really struggle of identifying what is the quite, uh, correct way to dispose of a battery at its uh, end of life. You know, where, where do I take it? You know, it becomes a burden and, and we've got to get much better at that because what we find from my perspective is the wrong battery in the wrong place. And it's all about the right waste in the right place. Oh, wow. The right waste in the right place. I like that. Now, I mean, something you said there, it's people using the wrong types of, of chargers like we'll get onto the chemistry in a second, but for the real world, like I, I buy, you know, if I lose my you know, phone charger that comes with my phone, I'll buy, you know, a knockoff phone charger. And if my battery, you know, in older phones, if my battery's gone, I might buy a replacement on eBay or, or something. Are you telling me that there could come, you know, there, there could be issues in doing a combination of those two things? 100 percent i'm sure paul will will back me up that you know the battery and the charger are very much matched to the equipment and it is absolutely critical that you go back to original manufacturer and equipment because they're set up they're paired together they work together in partnership the battery management system and the battery and the equipment and therefore just buying a either or replacement just a a cheap amazon type um search that comes up and you buy a replacement battery that can lead historically to problems yeah i think with you know as as with anything you get what you pay for and batteries are no exception to that so i think that you know in general uh people rely on batteries every single day of their lives right recording this podcast i'm sure we're all using lithium-ion batteries to record this podcast and i guess the guys listening to this podcast will be using lithium-ion batteries for that as well so 
almost all the time we're using these batteries and the chance of anything going wrong is extremely rare. Um, but as I mentioned, it is the case that you get what you pay for. And so particularly in the sort of, um, you know, replacement battery market, uh, making sure that you are buying, you know, authenticated good replacement batteries and having them replaced properly is, is, is really important um, because we know that there are a, a variety of different manufacturing qualities that can lead to batteries that, you know, last longer or less long uh, and uh, and batteries that may have sort of more safe operating characteristics than others okay look you know this is a royal society of chemistry podcast um it would be remiss of me uh, not to ask and jump into the chemistry do you like that use of remiss that's the first time i've used remiss i feel pretty happy with that so let's jump into the chemistry here uh, to begin with like when batteries go you know wrong problems arise with batteries what's happening there like chemically what's happened to them functionally sure well so let, let, let's start off with what happens in a battery normally so it's a lithium-ion battery so what you're doing is you're effectively shuttling a lithium-ion between the positive and the negative electrode when you're charging and discharging the battery and lithium-ion batteries are very energy dense and they're also very efficient so that reaction where we're charging and discharging has what we say is a high columbic efficiency and so we can do it hundreds and thousands of times and that's why lithium-ion batteries are so great and we use them all the time both in our consumer electronics and our electric vehicles and increasingly in sort of really large applications like grid scale energy storage um, but things, uh, you know, can happen that are somewhat unexpected and they usually result from some unexpected chemical side reactions or some electrical phenomena that can lead to, to short circuiting. Um, so on those side reactions, you can also get a bit of gas generation sometimes and that can uh, affect the integrity of the cell. And with some reactions like lithium plating and so on and so forth, in the rare occurrences that they do happen, you can, uh, you can eventually get some short circuiting behavior. In the case where you do have a short circuit within a battery, and as I you know, point out again, that this is really a very, very rare occurrence that, that it does happen, uh, you can effectively discharge that highly energy dense battery very, very quickly. And that generates a lot of heat and the heat leads to exothermic reactions and you get this kind of snowball effect. So, you know, a little bit of heat gets generated, but that's enough to trigger another exothermic reaction, also generating heat. And this sort of snowball can proceed. And if it proceeds sort of unchecked, uh, then we can get this uh, phenomenon called thermal runaway, which is the sort of large sort of catastrophic failures of batteries. Again, extremely rare. And just because you get some of these side reactions, most of the time they won't lead to thermal runaway. But as part of the research that we do, it's sort of our responsibility to often understand the worst case scenario in terms of what can happen. And to do that, you know, we do things that are definitely, you know, do not repeat at home experiments. We put, take batteries and we expose them to electrical abuse or to mechanical abuse or to thermal abuse. And, you know, we, we, we have great fun under controlled conditions blowing <laughs> these batteries up but it definitely comes with a health warning that this isn't something that you should be doing at home we, we fail batteries under really the worst case scenarios just to understand exactly what could go wrong in those very worst cases i mean i'm enjoying the caveats there and i was thinking you could add an extra one there to really test these batteries under you know a controlled condition you could um subject them to psychological abuse and sort of tell them they aren't good enough and they'll never be good enough. And oh, well, I'm, I, I'm always singing the praise of the lithium ion batteries, so I don't think there's any uh, any psychological abuse. But it's interesting when you when you think about some of these abuse tests are sort of just uh, one that the audience may be familiar with. But it's a standard test and it's called the nail penetration test. Um, um, what? No, 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 no. Andrew, why are you nodding like this is a normal thing? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, this is a thing that listeners will be familiar with. That's not a normal. Who goes around? Putting, I'm look. You haven't even explained it, but I'm assuming you put a nail inside a battery, or you it, stab it, it with a battery. It does what it says on the tin. Yeah, the nail penetration test is exactly that. You take a nail, hydraulically drive it into the battery. That is the extent to which these batteries are abused during qualification. Uh, and yeah, as, I mean, Andrew might have some experiences of the uh, uh, the outcomes of having done that extremely aggressive test um, but it's a standard thing that battery manufacturers do in order to make batteries as safe as possible before they go out to the consumer market so with what you've you've learned and you know all the stuff that you've done like very very briefly how can we detect any failures or like any degradation or anything inside a battery because to me i look at a battery a battery is a battery obviously um you andrew and you paul can look at a battery and divine some magic from it how do you do that how do you 
how do you know if a battery is good? Well, I, I can sort of give you an indication sort of during normal operation, how we know a battery is good. Um, if you're using a battery in a mobile phone, you know, or laptop or an electric vehicle, there'll be a battery management system and that tracks the state of health of the battery. And that can be relatively simple. It might sort of monitor the current and the voltage. It might monitor the temperature. Some of them are a bit more sophisticated and they have other probes in there that can tell you about the sort of physical state of health of a battery. And obviously in the lab, we've got huge arrays of tools and we're sort of pointing all kinds of X-ray beams and neutron beams and acoustic probes at batteries all the time to try and establish the state of health of the battery at all cases. Um, that then gives us some sort of signatures of when things sort of begin to decline in their performance. You know, you might see a change in the internal resistance in the cell, for example, which is an indicator that the battery is beginning to degrade. Over time, I think everyone will have experienced that their mobile phone battery needs charging more often. And that's because you get this capacity fade problem, which just means that the reactions inside the battery are no longer operating as effectively as they used to. And some of the active materials within the batteries are perhaps becoming isolated. So we've got a huge range of tools and techniques to give us the the state of health of a battery and also then to provide us with some indicators as to when the battery should be removed from service uh, and then it ends up in the recycling facilities and I guess there's a whole different range of tools that the recycling facilities use in order to to, to sort of maintain safe operation there but I'll let Andrew answer that one. And, that, and that's a really important point I think Paul that we, we use a battery it has a certain life it's quite obvious to the user when the, the life uh, dips away and the length of service becomes such that we want to replace the battery. Uh, within there, uh, your specific question, Alex, around uh, when do we know a battery fails? And, and with that, the general, um, th there are two things you'll, you'll notice. Either your battery is starting to get hot when you charge it, which is a telltale sign that actually something's not operating correctly. And the other one that, uh, and we certainly get calls around this uh, in the fire services, is my batteries expanding. And, and when they start to break down, you get this buildup of pressure inside the battery and you'll see the battery expand. And at those two circumstances, that's when you, you need to start thinking about what am I going to do with this battery? And, and that's the challenge for the consumer. You know, what, how do you dispose of a battery at that stage? And that's the bit that we're working on at the moment, that, that public education around disposal of battery at the end of its life. So again, this is an audio medium. Listeners um, can't see my face. But when you said there about, uh, you know, the, the two points that we should really be thinking about batteries. Now, I, I know when batteries like expand, I should really be like at that point, obviously, there's something wrong. You know, but when they're heating up, like a lot of the items I own, I, I know that when, the, you know, when I put in the cable, wiggle it, maybe like you feel maybe after a while it'll get it'll get hot. So, I mean, at that point, is that that's an issue? It unusually hot. So if the equipment you're charging becomes unusually hot, then that's the time. Yeah. During the normal process, heat will be generated, won't it, Paul? You know, as part of that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it, un unusually hot is definitely the watchword there, I think. Sort of, you know, if you feel the back of your laptop computer, you've got a battery and you've got lots of other kit in there and fans and so on to try and keep it cool. But, you know, if I pick up my laptop now, I can feel that it's kind of hot at the bottom. But it's not unusually hot, so it's not something that I'm worried about. I think it's also true as well that a lot of consumer electronics probably have a, uh, a function in them where if the battery gets hot, it will sort of reduce the functionality and go into shutdown. You might have seen on a really hot summer's day, if you've left your phone out in the sunshine, you get a message that says, you know, temperature exceeded. We're going into sort of sleep mode for half an hour while, while things cool off. So again, there's a lot of intelligence baked into these battery management systems to try and keep things safe. So again, we don't want anyone to panic. If the back of your laptop feels a bit hot, but not unusually hot. It's not really anything to worry about. But there are some sort of telltale things that we concern about. You know, gas generation is one of them. So if it begins to puff up, then you know that that's that's time to sort of uh, take some take some action. And that means you know don't try and charge the battery any further. Um, uh, but 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 certainly don't think about you know puncturing it or trying to take it to pieces. This is when things begin to go to go really wrong. Uh, so if if you've got a battery that's puffed up, take it to a repair shop. They'll dispose of the battery and uh, and and replace it with hopefully a, a sort of certified uh, replacement. 
but but you know batteries are a bit of a black box and we're happy to describe what goes on inside those batteries but also just to sort of give a, a you know a, a bit of a health warning that these batteries are not designed to be taken apart at home so uh, uh that's uh, certainly not recommended I mean, Andrew, do you um, feel like I do a sense of hypocrisy there where he says, don't open the battery and don't try and like penetrate the battery. Um, but, you know, in my controlled environment, I like to do a nail test and stab batteries and just see what happens. <laughs> yeah, a sense yeah. of real hypocrisy there. Well, and, that, and that's the point, Paul, isn't it? That that these tests and, and these extreme tests are done so that uh, we test them beyond their normal operating environment. So, you know, you drop your laptop, uh, you overcharge it all the, all that's dealt with but actually we take it that one stage further and we puncture and deliberately damage them to see how we can make them safer and, and that's part of the development there paul isn't it that we, we extreme test to see where these ultimate weaknesses are and how we can develop and evolve batteries to make them even safer Absolutely, yeah. So, so the, these really aggressive tests that we do, do under very controlled scenarios, like the nail penetration test, but that's just one of many different abuse scenarios that are applied during the sort of development and qualification of batteries. Uh, they are really heavily road tested. Uh, in order to understand what the absolute worst case scenario is, to make sure that the batteries that go out to the market are as safe as possible, but also to inform what we're going to do next by understanding what can go wrong. It gives us that insight for sort of engineering strategies to, to, to mitigate even the worst case scenarios. Okay. All right. So, I mean, very briefly, I think this is a question for Andrew. What can people do just like to be safe? There are uh, lots of um, systems inbuilt in lots of devices, but in certain situations where those rare situations where things can go wrong, like what can people just do to be, to be safe, like to be vigilant and stuff? So I would come back to my very first point, and that, that is a, a piece of equipment with a battery in, has a set of instructions, follow the instructions, uh, make sure you use the right equipment. Where you come to replace your battery or your charger, particularly those two items, make sure they are compatible, they are good quality. As Paul said from the start, you get what you pay for, and we see this with the hoverboards didn't we uh, four or five years ago there was some cheap imports of hoverboards you know kids toys they weren't compliant hadn't been tested didn't meet the standards and the office of product safety and standards stepped in there and they were withdrawn from the market so you know it goes back to you get what you pay for and, and when you're you're buying um equipment battery you know whether it's a laptop whether it's a hoverboard whether it's a toy buy from a repertory uh, supplier you know you you get what you pay for and you, you can buy cheap imitations you know we see it with e-scooters you know you can buy a, a really good quality e-scooter and you can do an internet search and find one half the price well if you're paying half the price there's got to be an inference there that you might be getting half the quality okay for people listening um who don't know London very well you know there's a London underground system and I was on there I was on the tube uh, a couple of weeks ago and we got stuck at a station because and and the um, announcer was saying that a person with an e-scooter like telling a person with an e-scooter they weren't allowed on the tube that they should like get out and I was wondering why now is it because like a battery poses a poses a hazard in sort of those environments E-scooters uh, are quite challenging at the moment. They, they operate on the, uh, the boundaries. A, a really good piece of kit, and we've seen the use of them through COVID and, and e-transport, uh, a critical part of net zero, how we introduce these sort of transportation modes. Uh, the problems with e-scooters, and um, I'll, I'll leave Paul to deal with the, the more technical element, but from my perspective, uh, an e-scooter is quite a robust piece of kit. And where do we put the battery? We put the battery between the wheels underneath and hopping up and off, uh, off curbs, et cetera, et cetera. Those batteries tend to get uh, quite a level of abuse. Uh, and we've seen a number of e-scooter failures. You know, we can't step back from there. There have been a number of fires in, in people's houses charging overnight. And, and it's almost like... Um, Going back to you'd have seen the the inset issues with tumble dryers that we're we're seeing a particular problem develop around e-scooters and 
but that's been worked on looking at how we can make it more robust. But uh, because of a, a couple of incidents, and bearing in mind the number of people that use the London Grant, London underground infrastructure. You know, you've got millions of people using that. On a couple of occasions, we have had an e-scooter foul within the underground. And because of the confined environment, London Underground have taken the uh, decision to ban in e-scooters at this point in time from the London Underground. Hence your delays, because London Underground stepped in and said, no, this person's got to leave with their e-scooter. And, it, and it's a bit like there's no smoking on the underground. You know, I remember days gone by where people used to smoke on the underground and, and we see a hazard developing in a specific circumstance and therefore we regulate against it. Yeah, and I, I mean, from, from, from the technical side of things, happy to sort of chip in with some of those sort of unique features of e-scooters, uh, but also worthwhile as a, as a sort of quick disclaimer as well, say that I've got an e-scooter, I've had it for about three years, I use it quite regularly, it's particularly during the pandemic, being able to sort of get around uh, independently and off of public transport, they're really, really effective. But they are quite energy dense batteries that you that you have in, in an e-scooter. You're sort of packing in quite a lot of energy into a relatively small space. And as Andrew pointed out, the space that you use in a scooter is obviously right there in the skateboard. And if you're bumping it up and down curbs, that's really quite as potentially you've got a I don't know, 80, 100 kilogram adult riding around on an e-scooter, bumping up and down a curb. And right at that point where the skateboard is likely to hit the curb, that's exactly where the battery sits. So that's quite an extreme example of really mechanical abuse that can occur. Um, and going back to the sort of qualification test that we do, like the nail penetration test, that's the exact reason that we do it to understand what the what the worst case scenario could be. Coming back to the e-scooter uh, application in particular, we've got a sort of market there that isn't particularly highly regulated. And there is definitely this issue of you get what you pay for. Um, if you're buying an electric vehicle, they've all gone through a very sort of comprehensive homologation process, which means that they've all been qualified and certified and signed off. But with some of these sort of e-scooters, that's not always the case. So there is a sort of really diverse marketplace back to that original statement that you get what you pay for. And then you sort of couple that with a potentially, uh, you know, quite aggressive duty cycle in terms of the risk of mechanical abuse. And, and you know, there, there, there is a potential for things to go wrong there. And I think that that the decision that's taken by, by the London Underground recognises that, again, as Andrew said, they've got some particular challenges uh, uh, in terms of risk management because of the confinement of the underground system that means that they have to regulate out risk um, and so it's a it's a it's a sensible uh, decision but I think it's quite a unique one I don't think anyone with an e-scooter needs to sort of be particularly panicked as I say I've got one got one myself I use it all the time I think they're great bits of kit um, but but there are some some particular challenges with that market. Okay all right so that is really interesting because it takes me on to uh, my next point you know, e-scooters one thing. You know, but we've also got you know electric cars, electric vehicles. Do either of you? I guess starting with Andrew here. Like, are you prepared? Are we prepared for more electric vehicles? Like, when it comes to those batteries, those batteries are very different from the batteries that I might have in my hand or the ones you know even in e-scooters. Do are are there provisions in place for sort of more electric vehicles coming to to market? And like, are there any problems that you have to sort of think about and you have to anticipate before then e-vehicles are, are, are quite a challenging scenario coming back to paul's points about energy density so once you get up to vehicle size you're you're now going to a huge energy energy density in a small space and and that's where lithium really excels in that energy density but now the battery is getting somewhere near 80 kilowatts it, it's quite a large piece of uh, equipment with a large energy density. So there, there are two elements there. Uh, we see um, the impact of car fires and the difficulty if that, that then goes on to involve the battery and extinguishing that because of the energy density, the heat release rates, et cetera, when you get into a battery failure. But let's be clear, battery failures, because of the point Paul made about homologation, battery failures are very rare. Uh, they're also, the batteries are, are very highly armoured, unlike an e-scooter, so that they have to deal with vehicle collisions. And that comes back to the nail test uh, that Paul talked about. We have to really put those, those batteries through an extreme set of tests to, to cope with all the scenarios that may be realistically involved. You're always going to have the 
you know, the black swan moment, aren't you, where you, you have a, a situation that you haven't prepared for, you know, and that's, that's a risk within life. For us, uh, what we start to see at the other end of it is the first generation EVs are now coming to the end of their life. And therefore, we're starting to see a ramp up in the recycling capacity to deal with these batteries. But exponentially, over the next four or five years, we're going to see a huge increase in these batteries, uh, these battery vehicles, the use of these uh, high high numbers of batteries, uh, high frequency battery energy uh, storage systems for the grid, grid scale, scale storage. So the volume of batteries that is then gonna come to the end of the life in the next five to 10 years, it just grows exponentially. And we are starting to work towards ramping up, but we're still developing the recycling technology. And one of the, the issues with the recycling, the end of the life is that each battery is actually different. Each manufacturer puts different materials in there in, in different combinations. And therefore, the recycling process at the moment is in its infancy. Jump, uh, I'm going to quickly jump in with something because we're going to touch on recycling in a, in a moment. But I'm actually have to offer an apology to you, Paul. So I was I was sort of, you know, joking around when I said the nail penetration test is a bit of fun. But knowing that this is sort of upscaled now to um, being representative, perhaps, of you know an electric vehicle being caught in a in a collision, essentially, uh, you know, I guess okay. I'm, I apologize. That right, is, I no, 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 no apologies necessary. I mean, some some people have heard about this, and it does sound like a bit of a comedy test, the nail penetration test. But it is described in the uh, the UN uh, standards as something that people need to do to qualify the batteries, and that just gives the audience maybe an indication of the lengths that that we go to to try and make these batteries. Uh, as safe as possible. And that's true for batteries that go into a mobile phone or batteries that go into an electric vehicle. They've all been through for sort of, you know, well-manufactured, qualified batteries. They've all been through this really extensive certification process. And that's why the failure statistics for batteries are actually really very, very low. Difficult to get exact numbers, but we reckon somewhere between about one in 10 million and one in 40 million batteries. So really, really low numbers in terms of failures. But recognising that we've got more and more batteries and increasingly demanding applications, making sure that we understand everything about what can go wrong in the worst case scenario is then letting us conceive of some strategies to, to how we can really engineer completely fail safe batteries we, you know with, with electric vehicles for example um those failures are very very rare and it just becomes a managed risk exactly the same as a petrol vehicle i mean andrew will will, will probably uh, from his experiences uh, know about the tens if not hundreds of uh, petrol fires that there are at the roadside every year but people don't worry about that when they get into a petrol driven car because we've all learned how to deal with that sort of managed risk and okay. coming back to you there paul the really important bit that you know, we're, we start to worry about this 80, 80 kilowatt battery in our car, but we don't worry about the 80 litre fuel tank in the car. And actually, uh, you know, a leak from a, a petrol fuel tank is, is actually inherently more dangerous th than a leak from the battery or a battery issue when, uh, you know, it's heavier than air, it's denser than air, it builds up in, in low spaces. And a, a leak from an 80 litre petrol tank uh, from a fire service point of view, can create more problems or, or more dynamic problems than uh, an EV battery, to, to put it in comparison. But it's new. It's new technology where we see these, these isolated incidents, which are, are very rare. We, and this is something new. This is something we're not accustomed to. And we've got to change our perspectives. I mean, I really like there that you said, like, you know, an 80 litre petrol tank, as if I'm not driving a 2008 Nissan Micra, um, which has the fuel capacity, I'm going to guess, of a thimble. So we need, we need to get you on to an EV, Alex. That's the only answer. We yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's what this entire series is about. It's essentially me asking contributors which electric vehicle I should buy. But also there is a second point of I'm broke. So <laughs> <laughs> in terms of now... In, in terms of things, Andrew, you know, you spoke about electric vehicles and petrol vehicles. You know, both of them have a small risk of, you know, having roadside fires, you mentioned. How do you deal with um, battery battery um, fires in, in an electric vehicle or in generally um, or in general? Because I assume you can't just spray it down with water. I luckily have never had to deal with a battery fire. But how do you deal with it? Is it any different from any other fire? It, it is. Um, 
very, very, very different. Uh, and there's a lot of work ongoing at the moment uh, as as these obviously as the volumes of EVs increase. So the volumes of uh, EV fires will increase. And we're starting to now uh, on that learning journey of looking at different methods of uh, dealing with EV fires because this battery is armored in the nature it's it's constructed because it's got to be safe in use. Um, they do create certain problems and we're seeing, for example, um, they will burn for several, several days in certain circumstances because they have to be deconstructed. You know, the battery pack, that unit is, is very well armoured. It isn't like a, a petrol tank, once a petrol tank fails, it splits, uh, the fuel comes out and we put it out. That, that energy density and the release of that energy, you know, it doesn't happen in five minutes. It happens over a period of time. There's a, a lot of cooling that has to go on to control the thermal runaway. But again, it, it's, it's, in, it's encased and it is producing challenges. There's a, a number of different scenarios that have, uh, been looked at. Uh, uh, for instance, in Holland, uh, they bring a skip alongside full of water and dunk it in the skip. Uh, we're looking at uh, penetration of the, the battery case, which uh, is on the extreme level and I'm not quite comfortable with whether that is the right way forward. Uh, it's isolation and cooling ultimately, but in a, a different set of circumstances and we're providing a lot of training nationally. They've, they've also looked at fire blankets, putting a fire blanket over the car. Uh, to contain, you know, it becomes a containment exercise. And I've seen those used to good effect, but the, the training, knowledge and understanding that goes with tackling the EV fire is very, very critical because it's a different set of hazards and risks that we're not accustomed to. So I mean, we've really spoken about batteries in use and batteries, uh, you know, mitigating the risks, the very small risks of, of batteries um, because of all the wonderful science and testing that go into it. Now, when it comes to disposing of batteries, like, you know, I have, I've got batteries everywhere. Um, I essentially have a bag of batteries in my drawer that I've used um, that I have no idea what to do with. Do I just put the batteries in the bin? Like my wife is sort of saying, no, you shouldn't do that. But then I also don't really know what to do with them. So what do I do with these batteries to take them away safely? And, and that is the wicked problem at the moment. And the, the government are just about to consult on looking at uh, recycling, how the local authority uh, collects recycling, particularly waste, electrical and electronic equipment. Uh, I've, you know, recently Curry's have, have taken big steps forward as that because the responsibility lies with those that put the equipment on the market in the first place. So batteries, uh, electronic equipment, your, your washing machine. And that's why when you buy a new washing machine, quite often someone will uh, collect the old one for you. And that is part of this extended producer responsibility about dealing with the end of the life. Your, your small batteries that you you've, you use, uh, your disposable or recyclable battery, uh, rechargeable batteries that you've got on your desk there, Generally, you will find in most uh, supermarkets, uh, outlets where they sell batteries, they will have a battery recycling point. Uh, and that is part of this extended regulatory uh, battery compliance scheme about collecting these batteries, going back to my bit about right waste, right place, ensuring that it gets to the right end of life uh, recycling facility that can then recycle those batteries. Remembering a, a lot of these lithium uh, batteries, they, they contain a lot of rare earth metals, and it's important for us to recover those rare earth metals and put them back into reuse. Yeah, and, 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 and I think that one thing that we see, obviously, with the electric vehicle market is that the, the, the challenge of recycling is an order of magnitude at least larger than what we've had to deal with at the moment. Probably everyone's got a drawer at home that's full of all of your old mobile phone batteries, right? You just sort of, you know, get get a new mobile phone contract, the old mobile phone gets chucked in a drawer and left there. But that's not the case. People don't have driveways full of every single car they've ever driven in their entire life. So when you get rid of your 2008 Nissan Micra, Alex, you'll, you know, take that to an auction or to a scrap merchant or whatever, and someone will take it off your hands and they will recycle it. And that's, that's a well-established process. But we need the exact same equivalent for the electric vehicle market as well. Recognising the fact that if you've got a, you know, a, a battery that goes into an 80 kilowatt hour powertrain for an electric vehicle, it's probably, you know, thousands of times larger 
than um, uh, than than a laptop battery, right? And so people sort of, uh, you know, not only then have this challenge of how to recycle it, people want to recover value from it as well. It's a big investment. People have bought a car and when you're finished with it, you want to be able to, you know, recover some of the economic value from it. And you want to be able to, you know, safely and responsibly dispose of it at the end of life. A lot of people, particularly who are early adopters of electric vehicle technology, are doing it because it's the right decision for the environment. And, the, you know, that's that's, a, you know, I am completely on, on board with that as well. But there is a, a, a sort of industry wide responsibility to make sure that at the end of life, we have a sort of environmentally responsible ways of disposing with things, of recovering those uh, critical elements uh, within the battery and, 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 and sort of making sure that that environmental uh, consciousness is uh, embedded throughout the entire life cycle from when we first get the materials out of the ground to when the battery ends up at a recycling facility. Uh, yeah, and, and that's a critical point. At the moment, these uh, first generation electric vehicles, because the residual value is, is still in the vehicle, a lot of those are going to vehicle uh, breakers where they, the parts are taken apart and they're resold. There's, there's still value in the vehicle and that's and we've not quite transitioned to the situation with your Nissan Micra at the end of life. You'll take it to uh, an end of life vehicle recycling center. They deconstruct the vehicle, uh, recollect the materials, and then they go back into the, the life cycle of, of vehicle manufacture. Uh, we're just starting to see that. And I had a conversation recently with a large uh, metal recycler in the UK about that they, they start to see one of these a week but they're expecting over the next five years that that to ramp up to uh, 10 a week, 100 a week, you know, even even to the point that we'll we be seeing thousands of these get to the end of the life. So we we're seeing that curve rise now and the industry is now working towards, you know, what does that look like? What is the value chain at the end of the life of the vehicle and how is it recycled? How do we recover that? And those processes are now starting to be built within that recycling infrastructure. But it, it's this wicked problem of, of chicken and egg. At the moment, you know, uh, companies haven't got the volume of the EV vehicles coming into the recycling chain to uh, invest in the infrastructure to recycle them. So we, we're playing catch up and, and trying to, to sit on that, you know, at that swing at the moment, you know, are, are we ready to commit this uh, investment into the recycling infrastructure for what is about to appear, but yet hasn't come? I mean, my first question, obviously, uh, Paul, Andrew, would either of you like to buy a 14 year old Nissan Micra? I'm going to politely decline on that one, Alex, uh, but thanks for the offer. Okay. It depends on the price, actually. I used to work <laughs> for Nissan, believe it or not, and uh, their value has gone through the roof, Alex. So you might want to hold on to it at the moment. They're, they're, they're fetching good money. Oh, OK. Gonna, gonna flip that Nissan Micra into a Tesla. That's right. Turn that mindset into a grind set. So um, in terms of what we've spoken about, you know, we've spoken about it in terms of very much the manufacturer level, um, but just very briefly in terms of personal responsibility, you know, people talking about our, you know, drawers of batteries and, and whatnot. When we dispose of them safely, is it just a case of me going to the supermarket and there might be a, like a drop off for batteries? Is that, is it as simple as that? I say simple. Is it as uh, sort of a single point um, as, as that? Very much so for your individual batteries. What we're also seeing now is that the government is making big moves around uh, what we call we waste electrical and electronic equipment. Uh, I, I went in my B&Q the other day and I see that they've got a we collection point uh, because it comes back to energy density and battery tools uh, are, are a particular issue because they've they've got quite a high energy density in those batteries and it's it's once you get to that size that's when you start to get the problem if that goes in your cardboard recycling for instance and, and much of the waste process is about uh, dividing the material and separating it and that that process will introduce mechanical damage to a lithium battery um, you know, we have shredders and all sorts of equipment within the waste industry. And that, that recycling process then mechanically damages the battery. And then we, we create the problem through mechanical damage. Okay. Okay. I mean, all right. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Don't put a battery inside a place where it might get mashed up because it getting mashed up can sort of make the bad things happen. Um, that's Alex's full use of science words. 
Now, uh, let's let's look towards the future. I mean, we love the future. The future apparently is going to be better than the current, um, which is a low baseline, let's be honest. Um, Paul, what are researchers right now doing to give batteries like a longer lifespan? Because that's that's the perfect world. What can we do to make batteries? What can scientists do to give batteries a far longer lifespan so we don't have to continue buying them and manufacturing them? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we, we do a huge amount of work in, in sort of understanding battery degradation. And for a lot of people who are consumers, the battery is kind of a black box at the back of your phone or in your hoverboard or in your electric vehicle. We don't necessarily think about the sort of detailed chemistry that's going on inside it. Of course, the Royal Society of Chemistry audience, I suspect, are a bit more chemically literate and maybe understand some of those uh, materials that we have. So normally in a negative electrode, we have something that's made out of graphite and at the positive of electrode we have a mixture of lithium and some transition metals like nickel manganese and cobalt uh, in a sort of oxide type material and the sort of uh, chemical the physical the crystallographic nature of all of those materials will dictate a lot about how the battery operates and therefore changes to all of those fundamental materials properties then change the overall properties of the battery. So we talked a bit about sort of everyone's had this sort of frustrating issue where your mobile phone battery, after you've had it for a couple of years, it needs charging more and more frequently. And that's due to sort of, you know, these chemical, structural, mechanical changes are really quite small, microscopic scales within the battery. The materials begin to just behave slightly differently. We get sort of degradation phenomena that starts almost at the atomistic level. But then the consequences are felt by the consumer because you've got to charge your battery more frequently. And so a lot of the work that we're doing on the sort of uh, trying to improve the lifetime of batteries starts with understanding those microscopic processes of what begins to change as a battery gets older. Why are the chemical reactions different for a two-year-old battery or a 10-year-old battery compared to one that's just come out of the factory? Why does the crystal structure of that battery begin to look different? Why do the morphology of the particles begin to you know, fall to pieces in some cases over long-term operation? And the first step in our journey in improving lifetime is let's understand exactly all of those sort of really fundamental science events. And then let's think of some strategies for how we can improve them. So can we change the shape of particles? Can we introduce some new chemical dopants so we can sort of try and retain the good chemical reactions and you know minimize the bad chemical side reactions? Can we think about how to engineer better battery architectures in order to sort of maintain the battery in its safe operating window for the maximum length of time? So there's, you know, there, there's been great progress already, but there's still a long way to go because ideally we want a battery that's going to last forever. And that's never going to be realistic. All these materials are going to degrade over time, and particularly as we use them in sort of very demanding applications. But, but you know, that fundamental understanding of all these changes, and again, back to what can go wrong, means that we can come up for solutions or come up with solutions uh, for how to how to minimise that. Okay, now I'm going to take it out of the um, the the lab, um, you know, out out of uh, nail nail into battery land, um, into the wider world now. Andrew, looking forward, let's say like 10 years, 20 years, where do you think or where do you hope will be um, when it comes to batteries and how we sort of like how consumers interact and like use batteries? I mean, do, do you think we're going to get to a safer point? Do you think there are any changes that people need to make? Or basically, do I have the power to make the future better or is it down to manufacturers and government and whatnot? All of the above, Alex, and and a question for you, Paul. What what I'd like to see is actually looking at the whole life cycle assessment of the battery, because at the moment, uh, recycling is uh, we put it through a shredder, we create this uh, black mass, uh, and then we we separate it out. And is there a better process? Can we design in? Uh, the end of life of the battery. Uh, but they're, they're such complex chemical processes, aren't they, that, that we put together to actually pull those apart at the end becomes very difficult. And, uh, you know, it's really important when you look at the future, Alex, or, you know, our, our rare earth metals are, are finite, aren't they? You know, we've seen this with fossil fuels. We're, we're getting the same with our rare earth metals. And, and what's really important is, is what we build 
we can reuse, repurpose and recover at the end. So it's the whole life cycle. So what I'd like to see over the next 10 or 20 years is a, uh, you know, cultural change, human behavior about, you know, right waste, right place. But then ultimately how we recover, you know, we shouldn't be talking about waste. Everything we throw away is a resource and it's how we recover that resource. And, and I'd like to see as much effort going into the design and longevity of the battery as the, the ultimate uh, end life. You know, what's the end point? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that, with that, Andrew. And it is one of those things that the circular economy requires us to do all of the above because we want a battery that is well designed to give us high performance. And there'll be a sort of consumer pull on the manufacturers because people want electric vehicles with longer range and they want them to last longer. So let's get better batteries with higher performance. There'll be a bit of a consumer pull. There'll probably be some regulation that will help to support that as well. And let's make those batteries operate for as long as possible in their first life application, right? So let's make that, you know, battery within an electric vehicle run for 200,000 miles and more. So we get the maximum possible value. Then at the end of the electric vehicle's life, let's think about what we can do with that battery next. It might be that the battery is no longer suitable to power a vehicle, but maybe it could go into a less demanding application. So we have a second life for this battery. So maybe we can put it into a, a grid scale energy storage application, we'll continue to monitor that. And inevitably at some point it will really genuinely come to the end of its life. And then it will go to one of the recycling facilities that, that Andrew's talked about. And obviously that industry is ramping up very, very rapidly, particularly to meet the sort of uh, demand that's coming online from, from, from sort of end of life electric vehicles. I mean, we could go for hours talking about recycling and circular economy and whatnot, and we will in other episodes of uh, this podcast. We will in other episodes of this series. Now, for now, uh, I'm going to ask the most difficult question that I like to ask people uh, when we chat to them. It's if you could have the listeners take one thing away from this, this entire conversation, what would it be? Andrew, I'm pretty sure I know what yours might be. It might say something about waste and place, but go on, surprise me. So, yeah, recognise that um, there is no such thing as throwing something away. All you're doing is, is putting it in another place. And what I do see is the consumer wants to do the right thing. So if they're putting a battery in the recycling, uh, in, even if it be the wrong recycling, uh, bin. They're trying to do the right thing. So what we need to do is assist that consumer to understand what is the right method of uh, disposal. And, and that's the critical thing. So the human behavior is there. We're, we're putting the battery in the recycling. We're trying to do the right thing. What we've got to do is create an environment, an environment where that is easy, easily defined for the consumer they immediately know what they do with a battery at the end of its life, depending on the type of battery, whether it's in their, you know, their battery drill, their microwave, their washing machine, or out of their mobile phone. And Paul, of course, to round this off, what would you say your one takeaway from this is? My one takeaway message, I think, is that um, uh, batteries uh, have been very well engineered very rigorously tested and the chances of anything going wrong for a given individual is really really rare um so i mentioned uh, earlier that we estimate the sort of chances of battery failure somewhere between one in 10 million and one in 40 million so the chances of your mobile phone battery going wrong really really rare occurrence but nonetheless, we want to do everything we can to understand the worst case scenario. And that's why we do things like the nail penetration test and why we do a lot of research into abusing batteries so we can design even safer batteries moving forward. And there are a load of options on the table in terms of how we can improve the safety of current generations of lithium ion batteries, both through improvements to the materials and the devices and the control systems, but also next generation chemistries like solid state batteries, where we're removing some of the uh, hazardous and flammable components in their entirety so i think there's uh, you know the risk is extremely low at the moment but there's reason to be optimistic that that will continue to diminish uh, as we move forward wonderful i love ending on optimism guys thank you so much i think this is this is it for us uh, both of you go <laughs> have a wonderful rest of your morning go have lunch early you've earned it um but you know make sure you do it safely <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone see you soon take care you yeah. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you.
That's all for this episode of Brought to You by Chemistry. Join us next time where we'll be finding out how better batteries could make energy cheaper, more reliable and more accessible in the most remote communities across the globe. It was produced by Hiran Joshi and Elizabeth Ratcliffe and presented by me, Alex Lathbridge.